This is the Truth Be Told podcast, where we unlock the secrets of strategic communication. Welcome to the Truth Be Told podcast. I'm your host, Dave Thompson, and today I am joined by Dr. Abby Morano. Bringing a unique level of experience and scientific validation to her work, Dr. Abby Morano is both a scientist and a practitioner in the field of human behavior. The United States Department of State has recognized her international acclaim and her record of extraordinary achievements, placing her in the top 1% of her field. Underscoring her recognized expertise, Dr. Abby has been invited to provide specialized behavioral analysis training for elite units such as the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force. This group includes agents from the U.S. Secret Service, the FBI, Department of Homeland Security, and local law enforcement agencies. Having completed her Ph.D. in psychology, Dr. Abby became a professor of psychology by the age of 23. She's now the director of education at Social Engineer LLC and specializes in behavior analysis. A regular contributor to Forbes and Apple News, Dr. Abby has also been featured on BBC News, Wired, and Forbes Breaking News. She's an active member of several internationally recognized research groups and was awarded Reviewer of the Year in 2020 for her significant contribution to the academic community. Additionally, she's an author, expert consultant, a coach, and a TEDx speaker. Let's dive into our conversation and learn how we can overcome imposter syndrome, understand how shame can facilitate growth, and how we can each become a work in progress. All right, welcome to this episode of the Truth Be Told podcast. I'm here with Dr. Abby. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks for joining me this morning. I know uh, you've been busy all week in between equally important interviews with uh, all the media outlets around debates and presidential elections here in the States. Much less important interviews. Sure, sure. <laughs> we'll talk about, that's the first step of imposter syndrome that we'll talk about uh, a little bit a little bit on our call. But as you all heard in, the, in uh, her bio, Dr. Abby's got really extensive experience across a whole bunch of different verticals and areas that we speak about on, on the podcast, everything from, you know, behavior interpretation to uh, even just negotiation and effective communication. But what I really want to focus on with you today is one of your, your latest books I have, if people are watching the podcast in front of me, with a bunch of notes to prove that I read it, um, work in progress, really, really well done, um, and kind of a personal uh, piece of literature versus probably some of the other research that, that you've done. Mm -hmm. So as we get into that, um, one of the things that I saw the way you described this, this book is this kind of importance of understanding and owning our own shame and how if we, I'm going to quote this, but if we understand um, our own shame, it can guide us to being our most authentic self. So maybe you can just kind of kick off with what, what does that mean? And then we'll get into some of the, the guts of the, of the book and your work. Well, a lot of the time we're running from ourselves. We've been through things or we've done things and the reality of our own behavior or our own thinking is too much for us. We don't like that reality. So we run from it. We don't face it. We don't want to self-reflect. And if we consider that all of our behavior that we engage in, we make a decision as to, is this the kind of person that I want to present myself as? If you're not engaging in self-reflection because you're hiding from yourself, how can you align your behavior with the kind of person that you want to be because you don't really know who you are? Yeah, I like that. And you have this continuous message throughout the book about uh, we're never done growing, right? And there's all of these things we have to do to continue with our, with our personal growth. Yeah, I get asked a lot when I teach you know, what does it mean to find the self and what is empowerment and how do we master our emotions? And then I get asked, well, when is the work done? You know, now I've done it, am I complete? And I say, well, there's good news and there's bad news. The work is never done. And it's good news because it means that you can always grow and you can always be better. But the bad news is there's always work to be done right. and you can't get comfortable with who you are forever you can't be like okay well this is me and I'm always going to be this version because life doesn't stop that way um, and you know for good and bad reasons there's been points in my life where something has happened and you just 
you crumble, something traumatic or something awful happens and you expect the whole world to stop and grieve with you. And you think, how could I ever possibly go on? So that person you are changes so deeply. But then it's on the other side too, where something really great, amazing happens. I remember when I um, finished my thesis and I did my Viva examination and I was officially a doctor. And you expect the whole world to stop and clap for you and everything to be different, but it doesn't. It carries on the same. And that's the thing. These things happen in our life and small things, big things, good things, bad things. And they change us fundamentally, again, in big ways or small ways. And if we just say, I am this one person and I'm never changing because I'm done with the work, now you're not really going to be growing and that version of yourself isn't going to be compatible with this new life that you're living or with the way that society has changed. Yeah, that's incredible insight and background to what we're going to go into into today. I mean, I when you're you're talking through that, I think about how much time has helped me reflect back on maybe how trivial moment could have been in the yeah. past, but in the moment felt like your world is is crashing down, but you look back 5 years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago and think, "Why did that stress me out so much? Why was that such a big deal? Look at who I am." It feels yeah. like a different life that you lived at that time. And that reality is really good for healing. I remember many years ago, while I was still doing my PhD, I was really struggling in my life. And it was just after my dad got very sick and I was coming out of a relationship. And every day you'd wake up and I was just so unhappy. I was so deeply in pain and there was a lot of things that had kind of come crashing down at that point. And every single day I would wake up early in the morning because I, I've always been a 6 a.m. riser, up, gym, you know, get on with my day. And I'd wake up at that time and it just felt endless. And it was that reminder of this won't always feel this way. And it can be a really hard thing to do, but actively every single morning I would say to myself, it feels endless, but it just feels that way. It isn't. And when I would get down in the day, I would, you know, I'd cry on the bus on the way and way to uni and the way back. And I would have to keep saying to myself, I know it feels this way, but it just feels it. And my dad would say the same every day. He would remind me, it feels endless, but it isn't. And eventually when you do remind yourself that, it stops you clinging to that feeling. Because if you, if you feel that it feels endless and allow it to overwhelm you, you're going to behave that way and you're going to start letting it affect in your behavior and I needed to continue on with my life and that knowledge that it is just a wave it will go away was really helpful yeah that's a it's a easier thing to say than it is to implement it that. is <laughs> it's a hard thing to do yeah you find this with all of these healing lessons and mindfulness and self-reflection especially self-reflection yeah. It sounds so easy. Why don't you just sit down and ask yourself hard questions? Right. And right. it's much harder. I, I got asked this on a podcast recently, like, why don't we self-reflect? And I say, because we don't want to. People say, I really want to be self-aware. I really want great emotional regulation. I really want to heal. But no, you don't. You want the outcome. You don't actually right. want to go through the process because if you did, you would. And self-reflecting is hard. It is hard because we're having to reflect on versions of ourselves that we really don't like and things that are really difficult to process and sit with them and not use something as an escape. And that isn't comfortable. Right. And self-reflect brings out shame because we think yeah. about our failures. And that's, I want to get into that because I know that's kind of the core, at least the, the beginning part of your book. Yeah. Um, but before we get dive even further into all these different topics, um, I know you've, so you, you moved recently to the States uh, and you've had kind of a, a really interesting uh, career path. You do a lot of work uh, with different groups of, of people from the investigative space um, and across a kind of cross vertical. So maybe just give our listeners a little bit of how did you end up and in, in what you're doing today? Um, my journey through education and practice is an interesting one. Um, it really started at A-levels in the UK, which is... For translation for the US, I don't know um, what the name would be, but it would be around the age of uh, 16, 17. Okay. Um, so around that time, I had been kicked out of college <laughs> at 15. Um, so I was also kicked out of my dad's house and my mom's house. So I was living with a friend and I had failed my degree. 
Um, but I managed to get myself back into college and they allowed me to do both years at once. They didn't want me to redo the year because they didn't want me to stay. So they said, if you do all of your exams and do everything all at once, you can stay. And at that time, I was not friendly with my psychology teacher. She didn't like me. I did not like her. I failed the exam. I mean, almost 100% fail. Um, But I didn't really care at that point. My mental health was extremely bad. My home life wasn't great. And I had really just decided I was angry at the world. But I managed to get myself back into college and I asked her to give me a chance. And I said to her, I'll prove that I'm here to stay because I'll write you an essay every week. And she was like, okay, you know, I'll let you stay. I did both years. Um, And it took a while for her to warm up to me, but I consistently showed her I was showing up. But I was really struggling because I am dyslexic. I was really struggling with forming my thoughts into cohesive essays. I just couldn't get the structure. So she sat down with me and spent some time helping me learn different ways. And I built this really strong relationship with her. And then I realized I'm actually really good at psychology. And that was the start for me because I found something I was good at. And I realized, actually, maybe this can help me understand myself. And then I gave up all of the bad behaviors I was doing because for some context, at 15, I was um, pretty heavily addicted to some class A and class B drugs and I went through my withdrawal and recovery period alone and I managed to kick that and when I found psychology it became almost like a new addiction for me because it allowed me to feel good about myself something for the first time in my whole life I'm good at and then I started to get really good grades and I realized this is so much more than just psychology it's a lifeline it's something I want to do for the rest of my life and at that point I said I want to be a professor of psychology. I want to work in behavior analysis. and I want to do this forever. And then I got into my first choice uni. I started working on research papers within my first year. Um, I got Joe Navarro, uh, who's the world leading expert in nonverbals as a mentor. I reached out to him, started publishing papers with him. Um, I managed to get a PhD with the Center for Research and Evidence and Security Threats. And everything I was doing was not just the degree. I was so passionate. I did so much on the side and I gave up everything else. You know, I didn't have, I wasn't a party girl. I didn't have many social relationships. I didn't have any romantic relationships for a long time. I just had psychology and I just worked so hard. And then my output started to speak for themselves. I started doing a lot of conferences and I was publishing very, very young Um, From my PhD, I got a lectureship in the UK, so I became a professor of psychology when I was 23, and then I finished my PhD when I was 24, and then I was working with Joe, and he could see that academia was draining from me. I thought that I would turn up every day, and it would be new and challenging, and everybody around me would be desperate for knowledge and information, and academia just didn't sit that way. Um, I really struggled with the lack of passion that a lot of the students had. In the UK, there was a real um, drive for just go to uni for the uni experience, which was drinking and going out. And it was so accessible to everybody, there was a real lack of motivation. And education was really underfunded as well. So the low pay, the overwork, it was just really wearing me down. And I didn't feel I was making the difference that I wanted to. So Joe introduced me to Chris Hadnagy, Um, who runs Social Engineer. And we had one meeting and I talked about my research and my PhD was focused in how we can use nonverbal communication to influence informational elicitation and the psychological mechanisms through which that works. And he had said to me that he found my work interesting and wondered if I knew anybody that specialized in informational elicitation nonverbals and ideally psychology. And I said, the person you're looking for is me. And I'm looking for a job. (laughs) And he said, how would you feel about moving to Orlando? I said, I would feel great about moving to Orlando. So we worked together um, to try and get a visa awarded. I got awarded a visa. And then here we are. I think it's incredible. It's an inspiring story. And you're not just, it's not just here we are. You're you're killing it. I mean, you're doing a really good job. And what's really neat too is all this passion that you 
uh, that you have and the work that you're doing, you're uh, spreading it, right? And that's, you know, yeah. writing the books and you're teaching and you're doing podcasts and it's really spreading that, that knowledge. So I think that's, that's really powerful. Um, Thank you. What else I like about your background and what you were just vulnerable enough to talk about is we have a lot of guests and there's a lot of people that get these great positions and their road to that position. Um, I don't want to say it was, it was easy for anybody, but it's, it is as it appears. And I think what's really powerful about your stories is how you worked to get there and the self doubt and the awareness and everything that you, that you kind of struggled through. And you and I talked briefly about this concept, but, um, we have a lot of listeners, a lot of investigators that deal with imposter syndrome. Yeah. And maybe you can explain a little bit about what, what that is. And then I want to just dive into how can we be better at owning that and controlling it? And maybe sometimes it's a good thing to have. But what, what does that even mean in context? Yeah. So, I mean, you're completely right in terms of um, my background doesn't always look like somebody in my position. And that was really why I wrote this book, because when I moved to America, I had a persona of being the very tough professor to get to where I was so young and in a very male dominated field, especially in the private sector, I had to be tough. And I've never been given anything. I've always had to fight my way. And I always saw, well, because I was dyslexic, I didn't find the same things as easy as a lot of other people did. I had to really figure out my own way. And I realized that maybe I won't naturally be the smartest but I will be the hardest worker in every room that I go into. And if someone's a harder worker, I'll find out what I need to sacrifice to work harder. And that was my motivation going forward. And my dad always taught me, if you're down on the ground, you've got to get yourself up. No one is going to reach out a hand to you. You just get up. It doesn't matter how dirty you are, how hurt you are, you get up. Because what's the alternative? So I took that um, mentality throughout my life. So I really had this hardball approach. My nickname was the Rottweiler. And I realized it. I had to pretend that I had a very clean, squeaky past. Because when I did move to America, um, I started doing a lot of media. I started working with things like Wired and Forbes. And I did a TED Talk. And then working with federal agencies like Training FBI, Secret Service... I thought, okay, well, I can't do these big things if they know that I'm flawed as a human. So what I did was I had that imposter syndrome of there is this deep, dark secret in my past. And the thing is, when we do things, we know that's still in me somewhere. You know, it wasn't a, a different person that did those things. Maybe I've changed, absolutely. But it was still me. So inside of me somewhere is still the ability to do that. So... I really pushed it down and thought, okay, this needs to go away. And what happens when we do that is that imposter syndrome of, I'm a fraud. I have this deep, dark secret of who I am. And this version is not appropriate for this new position that I want or this life that I want. So I have to hide it. Um, and we talked before, I say it's kind of like the Scooby-Doo villain where you're clinging onto this cloak going, I hope they don't find out. And I hope they don't find out who it really is. And you're just waiting for you know, them to pull it off and go, this is who you really are. So I had that. And what I found was I was limiting my opportunities because I didn't want to do a lot of media to begin with. Um, and when these opportunities were coming up, I was turning them down or I was suppressing them or not being authentic. And people didn't connect with me in the right way or I was not advancing in my career because I was so scared because of that shame. And... I would go to bed when I this was when I was a professor I'd go to bed and worry myself all night that if I put a website out what if people find me what if they start to know that I did these things and for months and months and months you, I was just on edge all the time and we feel this if you're going into a new position politics for example you feel like you have to have this perfectly clean past if you are in the federal uh, field you definitely feel like you need this squeaky clean past you have to hide all these other things you've done even if they're not big and you know unimportant in the grand scheme of things you feel shame for them so I realized that I couldn't keep on going this way and the only way I could move forward is either someone is going to come and rip that mask off for me or I could just stand up and say you know what this is who I am because I could go and do media and I was thinking what if I did media and 
someone found out I did these things and then I'm cancelled. But what if I stand up and say, I did these things? What if I just stop hiding from myself and hiding from other people and just opened the doors myself and said, there you go? Because it can't be used against me then. And I started to open up about the things I had done. And what I realized was it didn't go negatively against my career because I wasn't saying I did all these bad things and I don't really care about it. What I was saying is I did these things and then I actively made a choice to work on understanding them, change them, be better. And when I, I did it that way and I was evidently better and evidently different, the background that I came from was actually a benefit because I saw other people go, maybe it's okay to be flawed. Maybe it's okay to have made mistakes and I'm still deserving of a successful future. And when I started to see that, I realized I've got to get this message out. I've got to get my story out because I have a lot of young women that looked up to me and I felt I was being dishonest by not being open about how I got to where I am. Yeah, that's really powerful insight because I think when when I think about imposter syndrome, it's often people are put into a position that they don't feel like they deserve it or that they're qualified yes. to be in it. And I, I really like the take that you just had too. It's also, there's that, but there's there's also, I'm, I'm in this position. I don't want people to really know about my background or I don't want them to know about yeah. this thing that I did because it, it conflicts with the persona I'm putting on right now. What you're saying is own it. Um, yep. And that's the thing with imposter syndrome. It, it makes us feel like we don't deserve the success that we have, the position that we're in or opportunities presented to us. But imposter syndrome is normal because being scared of failure means that what you're doing, you're passionate about it or you care about it and you want to do it well. And it's also inevitable because when you go into something new, say you've just been promoted, you're going to feel like an imposter because everybody around you knows what they're doing and you don't. But if you're not in that position, it means you're not ever upgrading. So there's got to be an element of imposter syndrome at some point because you're to grow. You have got to be thrust into a position where you don't fully know what you're doing. So in terms of overcoming it, the first thing to do is really just remind yourself that most of us experience imposter syndrome because when we do feel it, ironically, it's so deeply isolating yet everyone feels it. I've never met in my life a successful person, someone who has a life that I want or a career that I want or something that I want, that when you speak to them, they say, I've never felt like an imposter ever. They always say, yep, I remember doing this and I felt this way. So talking openly about it is really important. And there's a, a, a bit of a... Um, I guess um, controversial take is sometimes imposter syndrome is telling you that you actually need to step back because we talk about overcoming imposter syndrome as um, the goal. But sometimes imposter syndrome is saying you're actually way out of your depth. And if you do this thing, it's going to have a negative effect on you. Say you're doing a big speech and you feel it and you go, this is natural, everybody feels it. And you take all of that advice and you do it, but you're not actually ready. And you don't have the skills, you don't have the ability, you take on a big project, you're not ready. That can have a really negative effect. So you've got to balance that, okay, it's normal, I've got to move forward from it. And what if it's actually telling me that I'm not ready for this thing? And we'll never be fully ready, but you can step into situations where doing it, taking that opportunity, is going to harm your reputation or career. So one thing I always, always say is you want to look at the objective evidence. So you need to look at, okay, when you feel like an imposter, have I worked really hard in this field? Is this something that I actually know really well? So look at your accomplishments, look at feedback, look at previous successes and evidence to your competence. Do I have the competence to do this? And review it. Because if you genuinely don't have the skills to do that thing, then that imposter syndrome is warranted. So really looking at that objective evidence of do my skills translate, I think is key. Yeah, uh, there's two two things there that I just stuck out to me. Number one is everybody's a rookie at some point. 
Um, yes. I, I like that was that's powerful because you're right. If you're not, if you never feel that imposter syndrome, you're just you're always in a comfort level and you're never growing. I think that yeah. was a really good takeaway. That second piece, you said you've never met a successful person who hasn't felt it. Um, and I think, I don't know, well, your opinion on this, uh, there's some people there who probably should feel imposter syndrome sometimes that don't. So I think there's there's an opportunity there uh, where something is a good thing. Like you just said, it protects you potentially, yes. um, but also maybe level sets you and challenges like, hey, I, maybe I need to learn a little bit more or I know even personally, I've done some expert witness work and, you know, some, I know you've, you've been in that realm as well. And sometimes they ask you to make an opinion about something that's outside of your scope and being yeah. able to say, you know what, that's not in my lane. Um, that's powerful, but it can be easy to say yes. Yeah, we have this real tendency to try and fill the silence and feel like if we don't have knowledge that's being asked of us, we're somehow flawed or inadequate. So when asked a question we don't know the answer to, we try and pull an answer from somewhere. When actually when you meet some of the most intelligent people, what they'll say is, I don't know. Because they're comfortable and secure in their knowledge and they're not trying to prove to you they have knowledge. They're just trying to convey information. And that's what I always say, try and convey, not convince. So if you're unsure of something, I don't need to convince to you that I know it. I don't need to convince to you that I'm smart. I'm not trying to convince you an answer. What I try and do is just convey the science that I'm well versed in. Um, and when it comes to imposter syndrome too, often um, it's fueled by perceived external expectations. So what we think that others expect of us, we think that we have this need to have this knowledge that if we somehow don't have this knowledge they're going to think that we're stupid or they're going to think we're inadequate and we really need to reflect on whether the standards that we're trying to set for ourselves or we're trying to meet are realistic or if these standards uh, are inflated expectations of internalized um, sources of external sources so do we think that this is what people want especially with social media you know, we have this idea of this is what success is and this is what people expect of me. But is it actually? And that means asking yourself, well, whose standards am I actually trying to meet? So a lot of it, that imposter syndrome comes from trying to set unrealistically high standards and then saying, if I don't meet these, I'm inadequate. So we're feeling imposter syndrome that is created from uh, unrealistic standards so of course we're going to feel imposter syndrome it's an impossible standard to meet like if you go on uh, social media and say take the market of um, real estate all you'll see is these real estate agents driving Lamborghinis talking about how many millions they make in these deals so say you are a good real estate agent new in the industry and you look at that you set these impossible standards and then if you don't meet them, you feel imposter syndrome because everybody else is doing this. But it isn't based on reality. It's those unrealistic expectations that you've set. So you need to then go back and reflect on why are these standards that I've set the way that they are? And this translates to every field. If you're an interrogator and you go, well, I'm going to do this many interviews and say you compare it to Joe Navarro, who, you know, he's a nonverbal expert and he's done like over 30,000 interviews or 10,000 interviews and you say well I'm going to have this skills and know, know these skills and know these things well you're meeting an impossible standard for someone who is just entering the field so you need to reevaluate what you're measuring yourself up against yeah and you you wrote in the book when you talked about social media you just gave two good examples right real estate and then Joe you this a kind of elite investigator and, and interrogator yeah. but even in the book you talk about um relationships or family life or you know people people aren't posting how terrible well some people post mm -hmm. the things they shouldn't but for the most part it's the great vacation they went on and the anniversary yeah. that they had and how wonderful their kids are they're not posting all the stuff in between and that I would imagine creates that same perception of a standard absolutely and we know from empirical research that social media f fuels feelings of inadequacy because we promote idealized versions of our life and idealized versions of success too. So when we're excessively using social media, it fills us with doubt because, okay, well, maybe I don't fully know what success looks like or fully know who I am, 
but social media is telling me that this is what it should look like. Or I'm only successful if I do these things. So we compare ourselves and because we don't meet up to these standards, we feel like we're not good enough. So limiting time on social media, especially if you find yourself engaging in comparison, is really important. And focusing on your personal and professional goals rather than, well, what does it look like to other people? Because often our goals are, how can I prove to other people that I'm good enough? And the things that we want are based on, well, how can I show other people I'm successful? And social media is really just so toxic, like you said, in relationships too, because we're looking at idolized versions of people's bodies and people's appearance and, and people's relationships, these perfect relationships that we see. And we go, well, I don't look like that. My partner doesn't look like that. We don't have this kind of relationship. So we then feel like there's something wrong with us or we can find someone better um, or there's something, you know, we're not a healthy relationship because we haven't got this perfect, um, we're not dancing together or going on all these holidays and doing these things, so therefore it's flawed. But it's not, it's just, there's not one stereotype or idolized type of this is what successful is in terms of job, relationship, anything. But social media makes us feel that way. And then going back to authenticity... <clears throat> If we're trying to merge ourselves into this version that isn't us, other people will feel it because it won't be genuine. And when you talked about that again in the book, and we just mentioned, people that typically don't post the journey to get to that end result, yeah. right? So let's we'll go with the, the. I think you talked about a fitness example, but a lot of people are posting the results of a of a diet yeah. or of a plan, but not. They didn't post the day that they decided they were going to sleep in and they were too yes. lazy or the day that they caved into a dessert. And so what I'm wondering, because I know, you know, our whole theme here is about communication. And I'm wondering how how much it impacts the way that maybe you and I could develop rapport. I show empathy that when I talk to you about my fitness journey, about a relationship, whatever it is, should I share more of the struggle and the journey in which it took me to get there? Does that does that help? us create a better bond in that conversation yes and it helps for two reasons one for building that connection with others um and allowing them that really the space to say oh okay i'm i can be human too but also we should be providing realistic understandings of how to get places so when I was a PhD student, I was doing loads of stuff on the side always. And I've always done what I need to do and then loads on the side. And I had a student say to me, um, I want to be where you are. And I get this all the time now when I'm doing the talks and the teachings that I do and they go, I want your career. You know, how can you have this perfect thing? How do I get there? And I say, no, you don't. You don't want what I have because you know what it took to get here? I say, do you like going out? Do you like having social relationships? Do you like good mental well-being? Do you like good mental health? You know, I, because of the way that I, and I, I don't work the same way now, but because of what I did to get where I was, I sacrificed everything. And then it took me a couple of years to undo a lot of the psychological damage that I did to myself by working in the way that I did because I gave up everything. And I was just in a constant state of it doesn't matter how bad I feel or what my body is going through. I'm going to make it go to the gym and I'm going to make it work hard and I'm going to make it look how I want it to look. And I'm going to eat healthy no matter how much I don't want to. And I'm going to force myself to be the perfect version of myself intellectually, physically. And I did all those things, but that isn't healthy and that isn't happy. And in doing so, I crafted this idolized version of this is what I should look like. But inside, I was so miserable. I was suicidal for years and years and years. And it was the point where I would sit down and just come home from a normal day. And I'm like, should I kill myself today? Is this going to be the day? And that isn't a normal mentality to bring into your everyday life. And it took me years to undo so much damage. Because again, I'm, when students say to me, I want this, this life that you have... It would be unfair of me to not be honest and say, you can have these things, but you don't need them so quickly and you don't need them the way that I got them. 
And it's really easy to be like, yeah, you know, my journey was perfect. I'm just a hard worker. I'm all these things. And it's much harder to say, actually, no, this was wrong. I shouldn't have done it this way because I suffered and I wasn't happy. And that isn't always nice to say, like, I've spent most of my life up until the past couple of years just deeply unhappy. I wouldn't want to give that to anybody else and paint that as success. That is so unfair and that is wrong. So I have a moral obligation to be honest and I think we all do because when we do go through those tough journeys to then pretend it was one thing versus the other and to not talk about the struggle that it took to get there then we're saying, hey, you can have all these things if you buy my course. You can have all these things if you come and pay for this speech or this training. But actually behind that is so much suffering and so much struggle. Not being honest is, is very unethical, I believe, anyway. And then also talking about that struggle and talking about the suffering and the pain that you got, have gone through and the journey, it gives other people that space to say, well, I've also suffered or... I've also struggled, whether it's suffering from working too hard or just not being able to work at all, going through those periods where you just don't want to get out of bed and talking about the reality of being human. You know, it suffering is the human condition and not talking about that reality is unfair on others. And when you do, it validates their experience. You have this ability to be very self-aware um, that you write about in the book and you can just list people who just listened to you for the last 35 minutes can feel that is the self-reflection. Uh, and you talk about that as kind of a foundation of being a work in progress. When, what do you think? Cause that didn't, you weren't born that way. I'm sure. Right. You didn't wake no. up and be like, okay, how did I behave today? What, what was the tipping point for you that allowed you or maybe forced you to be self-reflective and how can people learn from that? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And I, I'm glad you asked it because I am very self-reflective. And the me now, I have got a very healthy way of thinking. And um, I owe a lot of that to psychology. So because I work in psychology and I, I train mindset and I train um, mindfulness and emotional regulation and all of these things, and people don't think that they fit into, well, you train interrogators. But a huge part of that is emotional regulation. So in order for me to train agents in elicitation and influence, I had to have a foundation of emotional regulation. So in learning how to teach it and learning the science, I embedded that into my own self. So I had that advantage of what I study is beneficial for emotional regulation. Um, but I was really not this way for a long time. When it comes to our sufferings, um, there's three things we can do. When we feel an emotion, um, we can either escape it. So we do things to avoid the feeling. We do drugs. We get into bad relationships because when I'm with this person, I don't have to feel my feelings. Um, we drink. We might also isolate to suppress, play video games, anything that takes us away from that feeling or suppress it. So I'm not distracting from it, but I'm making it go away. I feel it coming up and it's saying, please, please process me. And you go, no. And what happens is it has a nervous system response every time it comes up. And you go, no brain, I don't want to feel it. Brain goes, please, no brain, please. And you get into this fight. And then what happens is the brain goes, fine. But we won't feel anything in that case. Because it closes those regions that process negative emotion, but they're also responsible for positive emotion. So we start to feel numb when we suppress. And then that third path we can take, because those first two don't sound very nice, but they're the ones that are easier. That third path is to heal it, but to heal it, we need to feel it. And that hurts. It hurts to feel that trauma because we feel angry at the self, we feel angry at the world. It hurts to process things we've done, it hurts to process emotions, that's just the nature of them. So we avoid that path and we take the suppressing or the escaping. And I did that. I took the escaping through drugs and then when those didn't work and I realized how much I'd ruined my life and I couldn't escape anymore, I said, okay, well, I don't want to feel this. So I suppressed it and I was numb. And I, I think it was that numbing that allowed me to just go full speed the way that I did with my career because 
Nothing else bothered me. I felt almost nothing for anything. I didn't want a relationship. I didn't want people in my life. I just wanted to work. But when I started to achieve all of the things I set out to achieve, the moment for me when I realized, uh uh-oh, something has to change, was I had everything that I wanted, except a relationship. I had everything career-wise that I wanted. I was living in Florida, a nice apartment, job of my dreams. Uh, I had bought a house north of London. I was, you know, that I still have, and I had all these things that felt unobtainable to younger me. But I was sat there and I'm like, why am I so miserable? I've obtained the things that I want, but I'm so deeply unhappy. And I realized that there's a different path I had to take and something had to change. So we get so obsessed with achieving these things. And when I get to this point, I will be happy. And when I get here, I'll mean something. When I get here, I'll be good enough. And I sat down and what I've always struggled with is just feeling like I'm not enough. Feeling like I'm not good enough, smart enough, anything enough. And I felt that. I just felt like a deep failure and a deep fraud all the time. And when I looked objectively at my life, I'm like, I've achieved a lot. Why do I hate myself? And why do I feel like such a failure all the time? So it was that point that I said, I can't, I can't live like this. Because I'm just going to keep chasing things and I'm never going to feel good. And I had done what I'd always done when I worked through uh, anything in my life. I said, okay, let me go to the literature and let me understand it scientifically. So I looked at someone who was engaging in my behavior. I looked at my feelings and I I looked at them objectively as if I was a data point. And then I took uh, behavioral points from those of what do I do? What do I change? How do I move through this? That's basically what a therapist does. So I became my own therapist based on the empirical literature. And when I did that, I was able to remove myself from that and say, okay, I'm going to do the hard work and be self-reflective. But that self-reflective element, it came from science and it came from an informed science. And the reason that I wrote the book was because before I dived into the literature, I read a lot of self-help books and I watched a lot of TED Talks and I tried to implement that knowledge and it didn't work for me. I felt great in the meantime, it had to be bulletproof, great. But they're not based on scientific notions, they're based on pseudoscience and well-meaning notions that sound great and sell great. Because again, they see vulnerable people and they go, these are what they want to hear, so I'll sell them. No one wants to be told your healing is gonna hurt, it's gonna be uncomfortable, it's gonna last years, you're gonna have to do it every day and you're probably gonna fall back into it one day and then have to do it all again. No one wants to hear that, but that's the reality. The science isn't as sexy as those you know, well-meaning self-help books. And I got sick of false promises. So when I went to the literature, I actually got myself to a really healthy position and I'm happier than I've ever been. And I needed to give that science to other people in the way that it's not covered in sugar and it doesn't sound really nice and pretty. It is just a harsh reality, but it's a guided reality that will allow you to be self-reflective. Yeah, and you cover that really well. I mean, the beginning the beginning of the book talks about exactly what you just said and how um, it's a continuous growth process like we kind of yeah. kicked, off, kicked off the call with. And you give some advice on how to own shame and to stop comparing yourself to others. And you talk a lot about trust um, and how can people trust if you can't trust yourself and some really good takeaways in in that beginning. The other part I thought was interesting um, when you talk about what does the literature say is how, because you mentioned relationship in there when you were talking about, about kind of what you felt like maybe you were missing at the time, but you talk about how important social um, relationships are, or at least uh, the feeling of belonging or uh, togetherness, um, and how the research supports how much that impacts our our mental and physical health. And maybe you can expand a little bit, a little bit on that. Yep. Yep. So, a lot of the time with empowerment and healing and self awareness and this like being the best version of yourself, we're told that we need to be bulletproof and that we need to stop caring what other people think about us. Like how many times are you told stop caring what people think about you? 
that isn't <laughs> going to work. Right. It's about caring less about what certain types of people and people with harmful intentions mean. But real successful people do care what people think so they can correct their behavior. And in terms of what it means to be human, um, truly, I believe that purpose and belonging are everything. That's it. The foundation of everything it means to be human, having a purpose, having something that we feel that we should live for. Now, that might be your career. It might be a, my purpose is being a mother, a father, a friend, um, uh, an advocate for a certain group. Whatever you feel is your purpose. You need something. But you also need to belong. And whether that's belong to a partner, belong to a family, you need to belong to people. And that's why everywhere you look, there's always social groups. Now, we know this because the parts of the brain that process physical pain are the same parts that process social pain. So if you say, I don't care what people think, absolutely you do because your brain is wired in a way to physically make your body hurt if you are socially rejected, you can die from heartbreak because you are physically affected by the way your social relationships are going. That's why these up, down, up, down relationships are so dangerous because you have constant cortisol, constant dopamine, constant cortisol, and it affects your body because it affects the way all of your organs work. It affects your digestion. If you're constantly in fight or flight response, if there's cortisol going through your body all the time and adrenaline, and then endorphins and then dopamine constantly in these really unhealthy patterns, it's going to affect you physically. And we are designed that way. And it's like if you have found love for the first time, it's all consuming because it is, because it just absolutely overrides the brain. That's why we're all a little bit dumb when it comes to our relationships. And if anyone says I'm completely logical in my relationships, they're lying because when emotions are concerned, we're never logical because it, when the amygdala takes over, it overrides the prefrontal cortex. Prefrontal cortex is where logical decision making happens. So we are always going to be emotional creatures and our emotions are so heavily dependent on other people because that's how we're built. So it's not about not caring what people think and it's not about oh, I don't care if people like me because you do. Fundamentally, we care what people think about us. It's about identifying is this person's intention harmful or helpful? Is this someone that wants the best for me? Are their criticisms constructive? Should I take them on? Because if we go, I don't care what people think about me, it doesn't matter. I'm so happy with me. And everyone's saying, oh, well, you do this or you make me feel this way. And you go, I don't care. Well, that's not a person I want to be around. Someone who doesn't care about their impact on everybody else. And if everyone's saying one thing to them, maybe there's some merit to it. But if they say, no, no, I don't care, I'm ineffective, they can't change, they can't grow. I don't want to be someone who thinks that they're so perfect in themselves that other people's judgment doesn't matter to me. I think that's a level of arrogance that we should never reach. And I, ironically, the only group of people that don't care what people think, psychopaths. I don't want to fit into that group. Right. I want to care what people think because I want them to feel that I care about their opinion. You know, if you're interrogating, for example... Um, you want your interaction partner to feel like you care about them. Otherwise, why would they trust you providing them really secure information? Say you have a criminal in the interview room and you're just trying to elicit information from them and they don't feel in any way that you care about them whatsoever, that you care about their outcome, that they can trust you. Why would they provide you such sensitive information? When they feel that you genuinely want that information, but you don't want to harm them, you are here to listen to their story and you just want justice, but you care about them and they can trust you. You're not going to try and, you know, push them under the car. You are actually there to listen and you care about their feelings and you have empathy for them. That empathy, I, I feel your emotions with you. Well, now they want to provide you that information. And we want that in all of our relationships. And that caring what people think and not being bulletproof is so essential to empathy. Yeah, that's a really good takeaway that empathy without 
justifying. And we have a lot of investigators that struggle with that, that boundary, right? As we're, we're trying to yeah. say, Hey, I understand this is difficult to talk about, but it's not, I understand this terrible, awful thing that you did yeah. uh, last week. And there's a, there's a boundary there, which takes me, cause I, I could talk to you all day about these, these topics. I don't want to take up all your time, but I did jot down, um, kind of t five takeaways that, that there's a lot more than this book, but five takeaways I had, um, and that if people are listening, there's, there's so much stuff to take away from our conversation, but if you want to immediately start to become a work in progress, uh, for yourself, I jotted down a few things. So maybe get your kind of quick, quick take on each, each one of these. Um, the first one I had was the importance of self-talk. Um, yeah. so kind of what, what, what is that and how does that help us or, or maybe hurt us? Yes. So self-talk is the way we talk to ourselves. So if say you're going to go to the gym and you go, I can't do this, or you got to do this because you're, you're fat and lazy versus you deserve to be healthy. Um, you know, I need to do this work because if I don't, I'm a failure versus I deserve success because the way we talk to ourselves affects our hormonal response pattern. So when you negatively talk to yourself, it increases cortisol. Cortisol reduces our ability to perform. When we talk to ourselves with kindness, it has that reverse effect. So we actually give ourselves a leeway to move forward more successfully. So when you find yourself going, oh, I'm a failure. No, I failed at this thing, but what did I learn from it? Because I deserve in the future to learn from this. Just that small change in the way we talk to ourselves really does have a huge impact. Yeah, that's good. You gave an example in the book. Um, I don't know if it was in the same section, but I, it resonated with me where you were in a class. It might have been uh, Joe's class, but you were in a class and you got asked uh, to kind of go up to the podium and provide an answer. And I, I just gave you a trauma response if you if we saw your reaction there. But you, yeah. you're asked to give an answer that you know off the top of your head and you just like froze. And I've experienced that so many times where I feel like I'm an expert in these certain topics, but then for some reason off the cuff, I'm asked a question and just like, freeze yeah. but afterwards you start to think i'm such an idiot but it's a self-talk of it it's okay we have this kind of psychological anxiety that causes that moment yeah okay. and that's why i teach the science of it for example often we feel shame when we're in really critical situations and we freeze and we feel shame for inaction and the freeze response is a pre-programmed response that is crucial for survival we have learned to freeze because if our body says, well, if you don't freeze, if you try and fight, you could die. So let's, let's keep you frozen to try and save your life. And obviously we don't have that situation in modern days, right. but we've still got that response. So when you teach people that, it kind of gives them that psychological safety of, oh, I'm not deficient. This actually is a really normal thing and that's okay. Now, how do I go about making sure that in the future I have a different response? Yeah, that was good. And I think, I wish people recognize that more because even if you're listening to a politician ask a question off the cuff or answer a question off the cuff um a coach an athlete that's being interviewed after a high stress game or high anxiety and yeah. they freeze or say the wrong thing we dissect that three seconds of a response um when everybody's just human and so it's natural exactly. to have that, that moment yeah um second one i wrote down here and you, you talked about this a little bit but um, setting and communicating boundaries is something yeah. that's powerful and important. Yeah. So if we don't have clear boundaries of what we're comfortable with, and a lot of that involves self-reflection because we go, well, what is my line? Um, if we have those bound, or if we don't have those boundaries, people are going to continue to overstep them. So we need to figure out what keeps us comfortable and what we're okay to deal with and what we're not. But just having boundaries isn't enough. Because people will overstep them, we go, they overstep my boundary. But did they know it was a boundary? Because often we really um, penalize people for being disrespectful when they weren't trying to be disrespectful. They really didn't know that that was your boundary because we judge people by our own standards. So if something's okay to me, I tend to assume it's okay to everybody else. That's what we all do. So when they communicate that it's not, you can realign those boundaries. But... The other thing is, so when we need to communicate, the other thing is too that it works both ways. We talk about respecting our boundaries. You should also respect theirs. So if you have different boundaries with someone, potentially a romantic partner or a friend, you need to find a way that both of you are comfortable. It's not just about your boundaries and communicating them. 
listen to them communicating theirs and find a way that you can both be respectful of each other's. Yeah, really important. And you, I forget the phrase you used um, as you were going through that section uh, in the book, but it's also the last piece of holding people accountable or holding yourself accountable to those boundaries. Because yes. um, it can be easy to set them, sometimes difficult to communicate them, yeah. really difficult to say, well, it's okay, it just happened once. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and when we allow people to overstep the boundaries, we forget we teach people how to treat us. So we're all of us, we're basically training everybody like dogs and ourselves like dogs because they work through classical conditioning and operant conditioning, so do we. So when we say, okay, well, this is what I accept, someone pushes it and we allow it, you've trained them to know that they can push it. So you have to set a boundary, but you have to be ready to enforce that boundary because if you let people overstep them they will continue to overstep them and psychologically you're going to loosen that boundary because you're like well they've overstepped so you've got to be strong on your boundaries and if you're like i'm not ready to enforce this well then it's not your boundary is it and you've really got to try and think to yourself what do i deserve and it doesn't always feel good to set boundaries because you might really want this relationship partner who keeps doing these things and you might go, oh, well, you know, I'll just move my boundary. But it isn't what actually you want and it isn't what's comfortable. And it can be hard to enforce them, but we all deserve to be comfortable. So we deserve to have our boundaries respected. And if they're not, then we should be walking away. Yeah, perfect. Uh, the third one I wrote down, we, we hit this a little bit, but um, you have a whole section, a whole chapter on empowering others through kindness. Yes. How can we do that? So... Kindness, often we, we give it when we give a reason, when we're given a reason. We might be uh, rude or aggressive or just not considerate until someone says, I've had a really tough day. And then you go, oh, I'm so sorry. And now I'm going to show you a little bit of compassion, a little understanding. And I've always been that way, very neutral, never mean, but just neutral. I didn't really care. I expected a lot from people. And unless they gave me an absolute reason as to why I had to show them kindness, I wouldn't. And it was only for me when my life was crumbling and inside I was so unhappy and I was being asked to do these things. And I was thinking, why can't you see inside of me? I just don't have the ability to do this. And I was so desperate for kindness. And I realized no one's going to give it to me because I don't give it to them. And then you realize too that even if you do understand what someone's going through, you don't understand the depth of their suffer suffering. We really don't know what people are going through. Every single person is carrying something with them. So why do we need them to communicate to us, hey, by the way, I'm struggling with this thing, to just be kind? And being kind doesn't mean going out of your way to be over the top to do these things that take from you. Kindness is just allowing them to have human flaws. Maybe they don't turn up completely on time and instead of going, you're a failure, you're late, asking them, you know, why were you late? Is everything okay? And just showing people a little bit of grace without having to be told, I really need some grace. And kindness can be hard because often we feel like we have to take from ourselves. And if you feel that showing someone kindness is taking from you, then it's time to pull back because those boundaries are important. But kindness is just those small acts. You know, someone's had a really tough day, you know, bring them a coffee or just make things a little bit easier. Um, and I think kindness is also when students say, you know, how do you get to where you are? Kindness is giving them that reality. It's just treating people like humans with pain that we don't know about and just not trying to inflict pain on them or... So all that recognition too, we get so deep in our own pain and suffering. No one else understands how I feel. So everybody should give me grace. Kindness is knowing that every single person is in that same position. And you are not responsible for your traumas necessarily. You're not responsible for the awful things that have happened to you. But you are responsible for your reactions to them and your subsequent behavior from them. You are responsible even in your own suffering for how you treat people. And there's that quote that, um, if you can't handle me at my worst, you don't deserve me at my best. I hate that. Because why should anybody have to suffer through your worst to be able to then... 
be qualified to have you as a friend. I get that our friends should be with us through our tough times, absolutely. But no one should have to endure any kind of mistreatment just to qualify to be our friend or to qualify for good treatment. That is a very arrogant way to approach life and it isn't unkind. Yeah, again, powerful. And um, we had a, a guest a few episodes ago, Detective Becker from Florida, and she does a lot of work with sexual assault uh, survivors. And she talked about this kind of mantra of, um, I can't, I can't change what has happened to you, but I can change how, how it, uh, you're reacted to going forward, right? I can be yeah. kind, I can be empathetic and um, really powerful from an investigative standpoint of having showing yeah. kindness. Uh, I got two more takeaways to wrap us up. The fourth one is a quote actually that you quoted um, from Shakespeare that you said it's kind of stuck with you. And it said, uh, if you are true to yourself, we cannot be false to anyone. What does that mean to you? So if we are painting a persona and we're trying to teach people based on that persona, it's always going to be fake. Like my teachings when I was trying to pretend to be this professor that got to where I am because of all of these you know, just achievements and hard work and not the struggle. I'm always going to be giving people false lessons because I'm going to be lying to myself. In order to provide people honesty, I have to be honest with myself. And I think that that's the hardest thing that we can do is truly face who we are. Because who am I to give other people advice on emotional regulation and self-care and all of these things if I don't practice them? I realize, you know, if you go to the gym and you have a trainer, you want them to be in shape. If you go to a therapist, you want them to have good emotional regulation. And if I'm training people in these things, who am I to do that if I'm not embodying them myself? Because then I'm not being a good role model. So that's how I, I took that quote for me. Yeah, I thought that was really good. Um kind of translation from from Shakespeare into what you were communicating in your in your book and the, the last takeaway I had which really um, kind of summarizes the whole the whole thing but really simply put you have accept that you're a work in progress uh, which yes. is obviously the title of the, the book work in progress but um, I know we kind of kicked off with that and I want to end I want to end with that point and give you the the opportunity to kind of give if you have one last takeaway that you hope uh, listeners leave this conversation with to help, you know, working on themselves tomorrow or as soon as they disconnect from the call, what would that be? Um, I think it would be that it's okay to be flawed. It's okay to be imperfect. And it doesn't really matter what we have done if we decide to be different. Because we, we have this idea that good people do good things and bad people do bad things. And if I do a bad thing, I'm therefore a bad person. But it's much more complicated than that. Good people do bad things, bad people do good things. We're not necessarily defined by each individual behavior. What we are defined by, however, are our choices. So maybe you have done these things, but you don't have to be tied to them forever. You can make a choice to change. We're flawed, we're imperfect, that's fine. But we have this idea because I've done them and I'm flawed, I have to keep doing them because this is all I'll ever be. You can stand up one day in the middle of the terrible decisions and say, I've had enough of being this person. I want to work on being someone different. And you make that choice and you can do that. I truly believe that we can do anything we decide that we can do within biological limits. I, could, I can't fly, but I can say, okay, maybe I want a degree in physics. And then if I made the steps to do so, I could do that. But also, if I decide, hey, I want to be a better person, I want to be a kinder person, well, then I can change and I can decide to do that. I've worked really hard on being a more empathetic person because I didn't like who I was. So I worked on doing that. And I worked on building a version of myself that I really like, and we can all do that. So to summarize my takeaway, it's that we're all flawed. We're all human but we all have the ability to decide to make a change and become that work in progress and work towards a, a better version of ourselves. This has been such a great conversation. Um, and I, 
I believe if we could fly, you would be the person to figure out how to do so, <laughs> I think. Um, I know you've got a ton of resources out there. So again, we talked about there's training, that you have a podcast as well, you've got the book, you've got articles. Um, what is the best way for people to find more about you? Um, everything is on my website, uh, abbymarona.com. I also post a lot of educational material on uh, my Instagram and my LinkedIn. So my LinkedIn is Dr. Abby Morono, and my Instagram is just Dr. Abby Official. Perfect, and we'll tag that in the show notes too for those of you that are driving and listening, and you can you can check that out later. But thank you so much for the insights. I learned a, I learned a ton. I got a lot of homework after this this call, but I I appreciate your time today, Dr. Abby. Thank you so much. Please make sure to like, share, and subscribe. And to keep this conversation going, follow the Truth Be Told podcast on LinkedIn and Truth Be Told CFI on Twitter. On behalf of the International Association of Interviewers, Rick Landers-Zalowski and our valued sponsors, thank you for joining us on this episode of the Truth Be Told podcast.